fills with different points of view. Uh, expand our vision this week. Help us to see uh, how uh, different people are, how big the world is, how diverse the world is, and how we are called to be your image bearers, to be your truth tellers, uh, and, and most of all, to carry your love into a world that won't necessarily agree with us. Guide us as we bring uh, this message today. Thank you for so many people and so much interest as we try to reach out to those that think differently than us and understand them. Just guide us our day today. In your son's name, amen. amen. So that was a longer prayer than I anticipated. That does not count against my time. Thank you. <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of overview of what we're doing this week. The idea this week is to help uh, go deeper into some very hot button, often divisive issues, not to try to reach agreement, but to try to deepen our understanding of those with whom we come into this week, probably disagreeing with and will emerge from this week probably disagreeing, speaking very categorically, but to, but to deepen our capacity to understand and perhaps to empathize with those with whom we disagree. So the rough outline of the week, and it's, it, it, we're a little fluid here, so today I'm going to give some, a general background overview of Christian principles of understanding law and the legal system, engaging with the legal culture, and then get into some sanctity of life issues. My guess is I won't get through all of that today, and so Sanctity of Life will probably extend till tomorrow. And then we'll go into some uh, issues regarding racial justice, race relations. Wednesday, my brother will take on the new atheism. I'll come back Thursday. We'll focus on religious liberty. And then he'll come back Friday and, and focus on the role of the local church. And I'm also working in uh, uh, faith and science issues. I just don't know where they're going to come up. Okay. Why do you come up in the middle of Brown's talk on Thursday? It's going to be fun. Okay, so now let me, uh, you know, the theme for this conference is Embraces World. So let me first address, when we're, when we're getting into some of these issues, we're at a very interesting time, and the past year has been an interesting time. Within the Christian community, and with the Christian community engaging the community outside. The divisions did not arise with the 2016 presidential campaign and election, but they certainly became more acute and unavoidable. So, before we even begin, let me say, some of us in this room voted for Donald Trump. Some of us in this room voted for Hillary Clinton. Some of us in this room couldn't make it to the voting booth because we were in the fetal position hoping it would all end soon. <laughs> Whatever category you found yourself in, I am glad that you are here, and I am thankful that what unites us through the love of a God who transcends place and time and culture is so much greater than what separates us at this particular time, in this particular country, in this particular political moment. And it's with that confidence that we can have this conversation. Okay? So let's get started. This is embracing his world. And the notion, the, the reason that we wanted to do this topic is we can react to this moment that we're in as a culture by circling the wagons and hunkering down and saying, those are the other, and they are opposed, and we are not engaging because they're a totally foreign entity to us. Or we can say, let's try to understand. Let's take a step back and let's try to go deeper, okay? So I'm gonna start out with some ground rules that I see with Christian cultural engagement. It's okay for Christians to disagree. I hope we're okay with that. And if you disagree with me on that one, then I'm okay with that too. <laughs> okay. 
Christianity is not the only influence on my views, and that is okay. Right? When we spiritualize our politics, we increase the cost of the disagreement. Now, that doesn't, what I'm not saying is that our politics are not shaped by our faith, that there's not a spiritual component to this. I'm not saying that at all. But I think we need to be careful to not connect every view we have on how society works and politics to a central uh, component of our gospel view. Because then when people disagree with on, us on that, they're not just disagreeing on some particular issue, they are challenging our core identity. And they appear completely disconnected from us, as though they have rejected us completely. So, you know, if there's a, you know, in Minneapolis, there's been a, a big debate about the minimum wage. Christians can disagree about the minimum wage, and we can have different views of market economics and what the effect of a minimum wage will be on low paid workers or on small business owners, etc. We can just disagree. It doesn't all have to come back at some level to the Great Commission. Or, I mean, we can just disagree about the minimum wage. That's fine. Okay? Now, are there Christian components to how we approach that? Absolutely. Can we completely exclude from our circle of concern the lower paid workers or the small business owners? Of course we can. As Christians. So we have it has to shape our stance toward the issue, but it doesn't have to dictate our views such that those who disagree with us have also rejected our Christian identity, if that makes sense. Uh, scripture cannot be the sole focus, just because it, it doesn't answer uh, a lot of what we're grappling with today. Again, it can shape it will shape our worldview, and it has some insight on some things, but it it's not going to get us all the way uh, everywhere we need to go in, in these issues. Uh, don't romanticize the good old days when you're talking about law, politics, and culture. That's really, that's really dangerous. So there, in some, in some Christian circles, there's a good old days mentality, and then if you get to the particulars, okay, well, when exactly were the good old days in American law? Well, we kind of like the 1950s, I think. Wow, 1950s were not a great decade for, for many members of our uh, American society. You know, you go back for every step along the way, there has been injustice and there has been oppression and there have been blind spots for our legal system and our political culture where people suffered, right? Whether it was African Americans or whether it was women or whether it was the poor or whether it was immigrants or whether it was working conditions, or whatever the case may be. I mean, you can go down the list. Right, as late as the 1800s, the first child abuse case could only be brought in America under animal cruelty laws. Because children were viewed as the property of their parents. And there was finally a case in New York City that was so egregious that the prosecutors had to do something, and so they used an animal cruelty law, because there were no child abuse laws. Okay? Those were not the good old days. We are fallen creatures. Okay? We, that doesn't mean we don't try to improve and that we try to, to practice justice, uh, but it means we have to be uh, clear-eyed about history. In criticism, be specific and charitable. Avoid generalization. One of the things that I think is so uh, troubling about our current political culture is, uh, and there's, we could have a whole conversation about this, is we've become very good at sweeping categorical vilification of those who disagree. So what I encourage people to do, and there's lots to disagree about here, there's lots of issues that we should be troubled with, but be specific and charitable. Don't assume the worst, don't always assume bad intentions, don't assume that someone with whom you disagree on a really important issue is somehow evil personified. That's not a great way for deeper engagement or conversation. Okay. The, uh, let me, I'm going to give you a few key Christian commitments because we have to have general principled understandings before we start getting into specific issues. So a key Christian commitment 
Number one, natural law. We believe in a natural law, meaning that there is a right and wrong, regardless of what is written down in a specific piece of legislation or court case. There are things that are right and wrong. There are some moral truths that apply always and everywhere. I'm distracted by my own slide. I didn't know that was going to be animated. <laughs> uh, we, also, we also believe that this is knowable apart from specific divine revelation. That we, we believe as Christians that we can know some fundamental truths of right and wrong even without resorting to scripture. And why is that important? It means that we can, uh, it means we can engage others about those principles even if they don't share in our specific beliefs of Christianity. Okay? It's the natural law. We believe it's written on every human heart. The... Uh, you know, there's some obvious examples. We can say what was being practiced in Nazi Germany was wrong, period, regardless of what the legislation that had been promulgated in Nazi Germany permitted them to do. Okay? That's a fundamental belief, not just of Christians, but a fundamental belief of Christians, a belief in the natural law. Okay, so why is it so darn unpopular to talk about the natural law? Well, two key questions. First, how do we know, much less reach uh, agreement on its content? Okay, most people can agree, yeah, Nazis bad, they probably violated natural law, slavery bad, etc. But in some of the really hot button things where people are actively disagreeing, it's hard to reach agreement on its content. And in light of that uncertainty, how can truth be superior to freedom. Okay, so a Christian understanding of freedom and truth is there's a there's a wide expanse of freedom, but your freedom is bounded by truth. There are limits on freedom that require you to observe fundamental tenets of truth. Right? So freedom is not just limitless choice. Right? And we can see this. If, uh, if you're talking about uh, addiction, say you're talking about uh, an alcoholic, right? That alcoholic, we would believe, reaches true freedom by limiting their own choices. There are certain truths that bind and bound the freedom. The other conception of this is freedom has to be broad enough to encompass the ability to define truth. In areas of uh, sort of meaning of life, and we'll get into this more of uh, sexual morality, privacy, how you define relationships, etc., the U.S. Supreme Court has kind of thrown up their hands on this, and for understandable reasons, this this is tricky. This is really tricky. But they've said, and cited this in the several cases now, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Right? So you have freedom encompassing the ability to define truth. And that's where we are. That's why natural law, most people will say, yeah, we believe the Nazis were wrong and may have violated natural law, but we're not really able to go much beyond that in defining the content of natural law. Key Christian commitment number two, human dignity. Meaning, we believe that human beings are intrinsically valuable beyond measure and worthy of love and respect regardless of their particular abilities or characteristics. You say, well, doesn't everybody believe that? That's kind of a, that doesn't do much work in these disputes because, you know, saying you're against human dignity is like saying you're in favor of clubbing baby seals or something. It's like nobody's against human dignity. So, where does it come for Christians? Genesis 1, God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created them. We are image bearers, right, as you heard from Kelvin's sermon yesterday. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. There's sort of a stewardship. You are charged with stewarding the earth. There is a little bit of, we have the dignity that comes from being past and invested with uh, some authority over creation. 
And then God saw that he had made it, it was very good. We have this blessing, this affirmation. All of these are just from Genesis 1, three strands that have supported the Judeo-Christian understanding of human dignity. The incarnation of human dignity also, this is uh, famous Pieto with Mary holding, the, holding Jesus. Uh, the basis for this in love, the fact of God taking human form and the fact of God giving of himself as a human to other humans. It's the incarnation. So Genesis 1 and the incarnation give Christians this understanding. We are special. And we have to treat one another in that way. So key questions in the battle over human dignity. One, is human dignity the same as freedom? We talked a little bit about this already. Christianity would say no. There are some choices that are inconsistent with our best interest in light of our created nature. It is not the same as freedom. Freedom is a big part of it. But it's not coextensive. Are humans special? Christianity says, yes. And we'll see there's some tension around that. But we say, yes, humans are special. We're different than uh, animals. Who counts as human? And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm speaking of traditional Christianity. And when I speak, for simplicity's sake, in general terms, when, and this goes for the whole week, when, when I'm not saying that someone who disagrees with this position is therefore de facto not a Christian. I'm not saying that. I'm just speaking in broad terms about the Christian tradition. Christianity would say everyone from conception to natural death. It's not a question of what we can do. It's a question of who we are. Right? So who is part of the circle of human dignity? So let me give you just one quick example, because this is a key Christian commitment to human dignity. And you say, well, how in the world would this matter? How, when would this not be observed? OK, so uh, and I did this. I, we talked a lot about this case when I did uh, this course five years ago. But so I'm just going to give you a very quick refresher on this. Uh, Buck versus Bell. Virginia was one of many states that in the, this is during the eugenics movement, that permitted the government authorities to sterilize uh, individuals they believed were mentally defective or chronically criminal. But there was some genetic aspect of their criminality, and so they could sterilize them against their will. Uh, Carrie Buck and her guardian challenged this ruling for Carrie, uh, and the lower courts upheld it and said she could be sterilized. It went all the way to the US Supreme Court. She said, this is unconstitutional. You're just some, some warden of a mental institution is saying, I'm mentally incompetent, and so I can be sterilized. That has to impose on my due process or, or core freedoms. The Supreme Court upheld the law, saying, you know what? There's ample procedures in place to make sure that you are actually mentally defective and that you will, your health won't be endangered by this procedure. And since those procedures are in place, that's all we need. We're going to uphold the law, and you can be sterilized. What's what's a particular interest is the court's reasoning, and I, I'm juxtaposing this with the Christian conception of human dignity. So the U.S. Supreme Court, in, a, in an opinion written by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's one of our most famous judges, said that Carrie Buck is a potential parent of a socially inadequate offspring. Now, we could have a whole conversation on those three words. What is a socially inadequate offspring? Okay. And he says, and so remember, this is in the 20s. This is right after World War I. So Oliver Wendell Holmes, for the majority of the court, says, if the state can call upon the best citizens for their lives, meaning the military draft, it would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. And then one of his most famous sentences says, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Oh now there's a whole backstory in this case. Wow. Carrie Buck was committed to a mental institution by her foster parents after her foster brother raped her and she became pregnant. That's why she went in. She was getting passing grades in school. She had the baby that was the product of the rape and the baby 
previous to this ruling, the baby was deemed mentally incompetent at, at when, he had not, or when she had not yet turned one year old. Right? So that is the basis for the three generations of imbeciles, without really looking at the facts. But there's this sweeping sort of analysis of saying, you know, we don't need to put up with this. Our society will be swamped with incompetence. So if you say, well, are there times when human dignity is not observed in American law? Yeah. Yep. Right here. Uh, okay, Oliver, that's a picture of Oliver Wendell Holmes. I mean, he is venerated. He is not vilified or demonized or shunned. We, he has his own postage stamp in America, <laughs> Oliver Wendell Holmes. So what did Oliver Wendell Holmes say? say? He said, law corresponds at any given time with what is understood to be convenient. That involves continual change, and there can be no eternal order. His judicial philosophy was, what works? And let's just do it, if it works. He says, every word of moral significance should be banished from law. He said, moral terms are just fluffy, and they just hide what you're actually trying to do. We should just get rid of the moral terms. And then he said, every lawyer ought to seek an understanding of economics. Do you see how that relates to Buck versus Bell? Okay, so you're thinking of Terry Buck, she's going to have another baby, and they're going to be on welfare, and they're going to be draining us from our tax revenues, and all these things. It's all cost-benefit analysis. Nothing against the economists in this room. Economics has a place, but when it's all cost-benefit analysis, you're running into some dangerous territory. Okay, so. What are the alternatives to human dignity that you might see in a case like Buck versus Bell? And we'll talk about other cases. Uh, John Stuart Mill, this is utilitarianism. Right? Actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. By happiness is intended pleasure in the absence of pain. You know, uh, if you were in the, in the Bible Hour, which I do recommend, uh, talked about the cultural river. One thing of the American cultural river today is we are swimming in utilitarianism, right? And then we're all, we all buy into it a little bit in how we structure our lives. We're all doing a little bit of cost-benefit analysis. Am I maximizing happiness and minimizing pain? It's sensible. It's common sense. It works. But if there aren't boundaries, if there aren't principles where you say, no, 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 it can't go this far, then you run into trouble. So there's utilitarianism is one alternative to this Christian understanding of human dignity. Uh, and then we've talked about him before, but I'll give you a little refresher of course. Peter Singer, who's one of the most influential ethicists in the world uh, still, um, his ethics that has been incredibly influential is focused on human dignity as a question of the characteristics of the person, what the person can do and feel and experience, not a question of who they are. So he says, the fact that a being is human is not relevant to the wrongness of killing it. It's rather characteristics like rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness that make a difference. <coughs> Infants lack these characteristics. And, and we can get into more of those implications. One important reason why it's not, why it's normally a terrible thing to kill an infant is the effect the killing will have on its parents. It's different when the infant is born with a serious disability, right? So an infant who does not yet develop into these characteristics doesn't have an independent moral standing that is deserving of human dignity. The reason we don't kill the infant is because of the sadness it will impose on other beings, i.e. the parents, who are capable of those feelings, and we do defer to their judgment. Right? It's not about the infant, it's about the parents, because until you develop these characteristics, you're not really in the, uh, in the equation. Some human beings are quite clearly the below the level of awareness, self-consciousness, and intelligence of many non-human beings. All right, so I'm just putting these up there. So the second Christian commitment, human dignity, I want you to see that that's not just a filler. Like, of course, everybody's in favor of human dignity. You've also got utilitarianism in there, which can be in tension with human dignity. And you've got this sort of singer ethics based on what you can do, not on who you are, not on your status or your, the category you occupy. OK, key Christian commitment number three, solidarity. 
Solidarity. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And we heard this yesterday, too. You see the image of God in those around you. You come uh, alongside them. You suffer with them. Right? We bear the pains of this world. It is love without exception. It is love without exception. That said, remember that proximity can shape responsibility. Okay? If I, if I see an advertisement on television about starving kids in another part of the world late at night and I turn off the TV and I go to bed and I don't send in a check, I think we would say that's a different level of culpability than if my daughter comes to me while I'm watching TV late at night and says, Dad, I am really hungry. And I say, oh, that's nice. And I turn around and go to bed, right? Proximity shapes responsibility. We have to understand solidarity. The love has to extend regardless. And we do have some responsibility, but there can be different levels. And we also aim to empower with solidarity. So the Catholic Church has in its, in its social teaching has a lot of really good work on this. The, the Catholic Church talks about economic justice as participation, not just as distribution, right? So in this sense, solidarity, when you're really honoring the person as a person and loving the person, it's not just about, okay, who gets what? Although sometimes that'll be part of it. It's about who is being supported and who is being empowered to participate in the course of their own lives. Okay, that's solidarity. Number four. Society is more than the individual and the state. This is called subsidiarity. This is another principle from Catholic social teaching. And the, the famous quote on this from 1931, just as it is gravely wrong to take from individuals what they can accomplish by their own initiative and industry and give it to the community, so also it is an injustice to assign to a greater and higher association what lesser and subordinate organizations can do. Okay, what does that mean? It means, under the traditional Christian thought, if I have a problem, hopefully my family can be the first responders to addressing that problem. If my family can't, then hopefully my neighborhood can't, or my church can't, or this other voluntary club I'm part of can't. If they can't, then my city hopefully can. If the city can't, then the county, and so on up the chain. Subsidiarity reminds us that it is not important just that needs are met, it's important who is meeting the needs. We want to meet the needs in relation. Right? So if you're, I mean, to stay on the hungry children uh, motif, if I'm, uh, let's say in the city of Minneapolis, they've discovered that 20% you know, of kids are not getting proper nourishment through three meals a day. So they pass a new ordinance saying that all kids in the city of Minneapolis will be bused to central feeding locations three times a day, and they can assure that every child in the city of Minneapolis will be fed three square meals a day. People would be outraged. Even if it would meet the need, they'd be outraged. Because they'd say, it's, that's not how you do it. You've got to support people so that they can be fed by those with whom they're in relationship. That's subsidiary. Uh, key Christian commitment number five, Genesis 3. We are fall. This is reflected in the Constitution, in, our, in the separation of powers that we have in the Constitution. Um, that we, uh, uh, you know, one of the geniuses of the U.S. Constitution is it has a skeptical view of human nature. And so it doesn't want to concentrate power in any particular person or brand. <clears throat> Lord Atkins, ap uh, that power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. And then this notion of groupthink that uh, when you get people together, it often doesn't go well because we just reinforce each other's uh, fallen nature and how we approach the problem. So one of the key Christian figures in helping understand what the, what the fall means for how we pursue justice is Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, he said there's no level of human moral or social achievement in which there's not some corruption of inordinate self-love. But, and this is key, but. Christians must resist the temptation to disavow their own responsibility for a tolerable justice in the world's affairs. 
That, so what does that mean? So the fact that we do as Christians believe that we are all fallen means we have to be skeptical about any person or ideology or party saying, we've solved it. But it doesn't mean we can't stop working toward a tolerable justice. Right? It's a skepticism. It's not a cynicism. And it's not an apathy. Christian commitment number six, be not afraid. As we, uh, in our political culture, in our legal culture, in our popular culture, as you take in media and are asked to participate in different you know, endeavors and rallies and so on, um, sometimes it's helpful to step back and ask yourself, how much of this is being driven by fear? Fear is not a Christian virtue, and we need to be very wary of how much our legal and political and cultural engagement is driven by fear. Right? <coughs> be not afraid is a core Christian commitment. Okay, now, any questions on that? And if you have questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand, and if it's not timely, I'll tell you it's not timely, but I'm happy to answer. Yes? What uh, Supreme Court <coughs> decision uh, negated the sterilization? What, uh, what Supreme, the question is, what Supreme Court decision negated the sterilization? Well, that's a great question. Um, what really negated the sterilization, okay, so in the 1920s and 1930s, eugenics was all the rage in the U.S. I mean, there were 20-some states that had laws like this, and it was growing in popularity. So what the Supreme Court did not take the lead on this, what historical event happened that really ended this? I'm sorry, exactly what is eugenics? Oh, so eugenics is the belief that we need, through careful planning, can create a better human race. Uh, and so sometimes we have to sort of cull the herd and, and winnow out the less desirable characteristics. Uh, so the Holocaust. Okay, so World War II comes along, and, and Hitler was actually influenced by some of the eugenics ideas coming from American thinkers, too. And so Hitler took it, obviously, to a level where even the strongest proponents in America said, oh, yeah, maybe that's not a great path to go down. So ultimately, in the 40s, there was a case called U.S. versus Skinner that struck it, struck down a, a statute that allowed for the sterilization of a, of a chronic criminal and said, and used some natural law language for it. But by that time, it had kind of run its course because the, the eugenics movement had, had lost a lot of its sting based on the horrors of the Holocaust. Okay, so we're going to get into sanctity of life, and I'm going to, I'm going to take you through some cases. Before I do that, I want to give just a little soapbox in defense of judges. Uh, some of you may know judges, and you probably found them to be good and decent and reasonable people. I know a lot of judges. All the judges I know are good and decent and reasonable people. Um, many of them have taken big pay cuts to go onto the bench. They're trying to serve their communities. They're interested in, in uh, advancing the rule of law, they're good people. There are some decisions judges have made that I disagree with, that I think are unwise decisions. Where I push back is overly sweeping accusations of judicial activism. Those judges are putting their own interpretations on the law and not just enforcing the law as it is written. That's an unfair criticism when it's made categorically. Again, I ask and encourage people to be specific. Like if someone has a specific disagreement with a ruling, then absolutely, let's do it. But these sweeping uh, terms of judicial activism are not helpful. And why is that? Because judges can't help but interpret the law beyond what is written in the text. It's, the, it's why we need judges. Right? It's an imperfect uh, science, this law, of trying to write legislation and then have it enforced in meaningful ways. We need judges to interpret. So let me give you an easy example. 
you're a judge in the county court and you've got a series of cases coming in where people have been ticketed for violating the ordinance. There's a big sign in the city park that says no vehicles in the park. Oh, well, this is going to be an easy day. No vehicles in the park. They had vehicles in the park. I'm just going to enforce the tickets and, uh, and reject their appeals. First person comes up, you say, okay, you had a vehicle in the park? He said, well, yeah, I guess I did. What happened? Well, somebody had a heart attack, called 911. I'm the ambulance driver, and I drove into the park to get the person who had a heart attack. <laughs> well, that was a vehicle in the park, wasn't it? Okay, so I'm a judge of Okay, well, I think what they meant was no non-emergency vehicles in the park, okay? You can go about your way on rescinding that ticket. Okay, who's next? Well, I'm the, uh, I'm the chair of the Historical Commission, and I, uh, I authorized a World War II memorial uh, that just got put up last weekend, and they gave me a ticket. Well, why would they give you a ticket for a memorial? Well, they said it's because I had a tank on a pedestal that was part of the memorial. Well, I guess that's a vehicle in the park, isn't it? Well, yeah, but it's a tank that hasn't been operated in 70 years. Well, it's a vehicle, isn't it? Okay, so I'm the judge. I'm like, okay. What they really meant was no non-emergency <laughs> operational vehicles that can be driven in the park. It's getting worse and worse. Who's next? Well, hi, I'm, uh, I went to the park last week. I'm a mom, and I, I was just going to have a picnic, and I had my baby in a stroller, and we were rolling through the park, and I got a ticket for having a vehicle in the, in the park. Wait for a stroller? Well, I guess a stroller is a vehicle. Okay, so I think what they meant was no non-emergency drivable motorized vehicles in the park. Oh, who's next? Well, you know, I'm an elderly gentleman. I don't get around very well anymore, and I was going with my family on a picnic on my motorized scooter in the park, and I got it. All right, you get the idea. <laughs> Judges have to interpret the law beyond what is written for me. You can't escape it. So again, there, are there judges worthy of criticism? Absolutely. But I, am, I get concerned about the cynicism it inspires to say, well, judges are just activists now. And they're just writing their own laws and not, not just enforcing the verbatim terms. Well, judges have always done that. That's part of judging. And I, I, I've, I've studied and spent time in other legal systems. The United States, for all its faults, has the best legal system in the world. No question about it. And it depends on men and women of integrity to act as judges and who are supported and respected by the public. And so that's my little soapbox on judicial activism, which doesn't mean I won't criticize some particular ruling, but trying to be specific. OK, so let's, any questions so far? We're still good? Okay. Uh, have you seen the sign on the church door? What? Have you seen the sign on the church door? No, what does that no, say? No shoes, no shirts, no service? <laughs> we could have a whole seminar on that. <laughs> Do sandals count, right? Yeah. Jesus time. Uh, okay, so let's start with sanctity of life. Right, Christian? Christian commitments to human dignity, Christian commitments to solidarity. Who's outside the circle, right? Is the unborn human being outside the circle? Uh, this will be familiar to, to many of you. Abortion in the United States is basically permissible up to birth. And I'll talk a little bit about Roe versus Wade in a while to explain how you get there. Um, more than 59 million abortions in the United States since Roe versus Wade in 1973. 59 million. They, U.S. abortions peaked in 1990 and have been on a gradual downward slope since then. So there is a, there, there are fewer abortions in the U.S. than there were, but still uh, obviously a lot. Worldwide, more than 42 million abortions performed each year. What's here is genetic selective abortions. We could have a whole week on what's coming here. Some of you might have seen it. I haven't studied it in depth, but just in the last couple of weeks, they announced where they created an embryo and they announced that they were able to edit the gene sequence within the embryo to, I'm not a scientist, but to do something good. Uh, and so the news was, this is awesome, right? We can now do some editing that will, that will reduce disease and some, some genetic problems to come. But of course, they created the embryo 
did the editing, and then discarded the input. So it, it creates some ethical issues too. So that's a, that's a whole other topic. But where are we um, in what's happened with our debate on abortion in the U.S.? Who won in American law? Is it the Judeo-Christian view that all life is sacred? Or is it Peter Singer's view that the moral status of life depends on the characteristics of the life? Well, actually, neither one. What one is individual autonomy. Okay, and autonomy, when I use the word autonomy, it's not just freedom, it's not just independence, it's this notion that you should be empowered to make the decisions about your own life as though there's some self-sufficiency in that. That's, that's the autonomy. Okay, now before your eyes glaze over, we're going to walk through some cases. So if you have caffeine, take a big gulp because I don't, I don't, want, you to, I don't want you to zone out. This is, if there's one thing you take away today, this is the slide. What I want you to see is how American law evolves for understandable reasons to a place that traditional Christian understandings would not recognize as, as, as just applications, okay? So, just a little background. America is a common law system, meaning that courts look to previous rulings on similar issues to inform their rulings on the current issues. It builds, American law builds over the centuries, right? So in these cases I'm going to talk about, it's all about interpreting the U.S. Constitution consistently with the courts that have interpreted it before you, right? So let's start in 1923 and 1925. Meyer versus Nebraska. The Nebraska legislature passed a law that prohibited the teaching of foreign language to children under eighth grade, well, younger than eighth grade. You could not teach foreign language to a child before eighth grade. <clears throat> So this was passed, uh, this was passed a few years before 1923. What language do you think they were worried about? Then? German. German, right? World War I. We're going to have this, you know, disloyal fifth column of the enemy rising up on the prairie to kill us in our sleep. The notion that they're going to be more loyal to the fatherland than they are to the U.S. So it was a concern about kids learning German that caused Nebraska to outlaw the teaching of foreign languages before eighth grade. The U.S. Supreme Court said, no, 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 you, you, you can't do that. The court said there is something natural, there is a natural right of a parent to direct the upbringing of their child. Even though it doesn't say that in the Constitution, that's just presumed. Our society is based on an understanding of the social order where parents can direct the upbringing of their children. If a parent wants to teach their child a foreign language, the government cannot stand in the way. It was very much a natural law type re reading. That there are certain natural rights we have. So the law was struck down. Pierce versus Society of Sisters. That was a case in Oregon. The Oregon legislature passed a law that said every child in the state has to attend public school. What were they worried about? Catholics. They were worried about Catholics. Okay? And, they, and there were lots of other states that had similar things, where we have this recent wave of Catholic immigration, and they're going to come over, and they're going to do their papist stuff, and they're going to be loyal to the Pope and not loyal to the United States. Every good citizen of Oregon has to send their kids to public school. U.S. Supreme Court stepped in and said, uh, no. Citing what case? Meyer, right? Building on Meyer. They're saying, no, no, no. There is a natural right to direct the upbringing of your child. If you're going to send your kids to a private school, the government can't stand in the way of doing it. You still see Meyer here cited today in some homeschooling cases and some other private school cases. I mean, it's still still good law. So those are the two cases, and 
uh, traditional Christians at the time and since then would stand up and say, absolutely, that was, those were two great Supreme Court opinions. Okay, Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965. Uh, uh, okay, oh, before I get there, so think about how culture shapes this. So in the 20s and the teens, we're concerned about World War I and immigrants and et cetera, that, and Catholics, that shapes all that. So immigration and, and sort of an anti-immigration fervor has shaped those two cases. Griswold, 1965, we're getting into the sexual revolution. So Griswold was a case where Connecticut had a law that prohibited the use of contraceptives by everyone, including married couples. Okay? So it, it, it prohibited the sale too, but prohibited the sale and the use of contraceptives by everyone, which included married couples. Uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. That violates the Constitution. And it violates the Constitution because there are certain natural rights that flow from relationships on which our society is founded. And marriage is one of those relationships. So two components. One, the law was unconstitutional by prohibiting the use of contraceptives because that presumed that government agents could invade the marital bedroom to prohibit the use. That was extremely private because it was use. And the fact that it include married couples the court said a married couple is an entity that is central to our society, that predates our form of government, and to tell that married couple what they can or cannot do in terms of their own creation of new life goes beyond the limits of what our Constitution uh, would prohibit. So that law was struck down. And most, I think, a, a lot of most traditional Christians would say, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. 1972, uh, I forget which state it was, it might have been New York, it was another state out east. They read Griswold versus Connecticut, and they said, okay, well, we can't do that anymore. But here's what we can do. We are going to ban the sale and distribution of contraceptives to single people. Okay? See what they did? We're not getting into anybody's bedroom. We're not prohibiting the use. We're prohibiting the sale and distribution. So it's like out on the street or in stores or in shops. And it's just to single people. Married people can go to their doctors and get a prescription for contraceptives and, and plan their families. But single people, we don't. We don't want them doing this stuff anyway, right? Now there was, there's some odd logic in there too, but we don't need to get into that. But single people, distribution or sin. Um, Eisenstadt says, uh, if it matters that a couple can make decisions in private about their own procreation. It has to matter to single people just as much. Right? It's meaningful to single people. And if it matters that they should be able to use it under Griswold, well then they have to be able to buy it. Right? So Eisenstadt says, your law's gone too. Right? So how it's built so far. Oh, and I should have mentioned this. Griswold cited Meyer and Pierce by saying, there are certain relationships, parent, child, married couple, that put limits on what the government can do. Eisenstadt cites Griswold saying, the right to make your own determination about procreation is a central limitation on government power. Okay? So, you have Eisenstadt, and it only took one year to get to Roe versus Wade, right? Because Roe versus Wade looked at Eisenstadt and says, okay, we just ruled that an individual, not a married couple, an individual has the right 
to obtain products or services that empower them to make decisions about their own procreation. Once you have that, it's not a very far leap to say, and that individual's right to make decisions about their own procreation includes the right to terminate a pregnancy. Okay? So Isaac said took it all the way up to the point of pregnancy, and then Roe took it over that line. And that's where the traditional Christian community sort of threw up their hands and said, wait a second, where did this come from? Well, this it came from Meyer and Pierce. Because all of these, all of these, and people criticize Roe, and I criticize Roe for, for basing rights beyond the text of the Constitution. But Meyer and Pierce did the same thing. It's just traditionally, traditional Christian communities like the way that Meyer and Pierce did it, and not so much how Roe did it. Okay? So you get up to Roe. And Roe obviously is citing Eisenstadt. Eisenstadt is citing Griswold. Griswold is citing Meyer and Pierce. Lawrence versus Texas. So Texas had a law that forbade uh, acts of uh, sodomy between same-sex <coughs> individuals. And so in that case, uh, police were called to a home and forcibly entered the home to investigate a reported crime and found a gay couple in the midst of a sexual act. They were arrested and charged with violating this anti-sodomy statute. Uh, and it, just as a reminder, uh, all these cases I'm focused on, we're talking about whether the law was constitutional, whether the law could be a law or had to be struck down. Even those who say that these laws are constitutional, some of the judges also said, like in the case of uh, Griswold, the case of Lawrence, called it an uncommonly silly law, right? Like, why should we be legislating these things? So that's a different question that we're not getting to. We're talking about whether it's constitutional. So Lawrence versus Texas said, you know, if you, if you have the right as an individual to define the meaning of life and when life begins and whether you bring a new life into the world. And if you have the right as a couple in Griswold to make decisions for yourself in the privacy of your own home and your own bedroom, well, the fact that you are a couple of the same sex doesn't change that, right? You should also be able to make private decisions about your own sexual lives and your intimacy and the meaning of life you have together. And so Lawrence is citing Griswold and citing Roe to say a law that strikes down, a law that forbids same-sex sexual acts is also unconstitutional. Okay? 2015, Obergefell. So this is a lawsuit brought by several different long-time committed same-sex couples saying there is no reason why our commitment to each other should be disqualified under the law from the same rights and benefits as similarly situated opposite-sex couples. The Supreme Court, and we'll talk, when we talk about religious liberty, we'll talk in more depth about Obergefell, but the Supreme Court said, you're right, citing Lawrence, right? If the fact that you are a same-sex couple doesn't give the state any more right to barge into your private affairs to arrest you for certain sexual, consensual, consensual, conduct, that the fact that you're a same-sex couple also doesn't give the state the right to tell you you can't uh, avail yourself of the same privileges and rights that a opposite-sex married couple is entitled to. So same-sex marriage 
is the constitutionally mandated law of the land, even though there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution about that. Okay? So I just want you to see how all of this links together. And you can pick particular points along the way to say, well, here's where they jumped off the track, or here's where they went too far. But I don't want you to get this picture that suddenly in year X, the judiciary became evil personified and was out to turn upside down the American legal order and social order. This is a very gradual progression of thought that increasingly celebrates individual autonomy for understandable reasons. Right? For understandable reasons. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. <laughs> Let's keep on rolling. Let me give you a, a little bit more on Roe versus Wade. Because this is, this is the linchpin of debates over sanctity of life. And then we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about why, what the points of dispute are. All, this is all with, a, with an eye toward trying to increase understanding of those with whom we disagree on this. So Roe versus Wade said the right of privacy Right, from Eisenstadt and Griswold and those other cases, is broad enough to encompass a decision to terminate pregnancy. It says, we, not, we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. There's a lot in that sentence. Okay? We need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. One might say, by deciding they're not resolving it, they are resolving it. Okay? When those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are able to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. So what did they do? They adopted a trimester approach, saying that the in the first trimester, the state cannot interfere with the uh, woman's decision to terminate her pregnancy, period. Second trimester, the state can regulate the decision for abortion in order to promote maternal health. In the third trimester, or, or post-viability, this is one of the problems we have with abortion law, is it, it's not very fluid. As viability moves up because of technology, we're still kind of stuck in this trimester approach. But the third trimester, it said the state can prohibit abortion except where necessary to preserve the life or health of the mother. And so at the beginning when I said in the United States, abortion is permissible up to birth. Well, how do I reconcile that with that third trimester? <coughs> Uh, statement there. And that's because at the same time Roe versus Wade was issued, Doe versus Bolton was issued. Doe versus Bolton, in a similar case, defined the health of the mother to include all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age as relevant to the well-being of the baby. So health encompasses everything. Right? So that that's why it's permissible up to birth under America. All right, what I want to spend a few minutes doing is really trying to distill what's the point of dispute here, right? And you look at abortion politics today, so polarized, right? And you might have seen in, in uh, the Women's March earlier this year in Washington, there was a big hubbub because the Women's March organizers would not let a pro-life feminist group participate in the march in a formal way. And a lot of people were scratching their heads and saying, you got to be kidding me, right? There's, we can't even be part of the march? Um, and so I wanted to still, how did we get to this point? What is really the point of dispute? Okay, you read Roe versus Wade and you think, well, the point of dispute is when does life begin? I mean, there's no way to know when life begins. That's just, you know, it's a black box. We can't do anything about it. So I'm not going to read all these. But on, if you have the handout, you'll see, I just cut and pasted uh, from other uh, sources from medical textbooks about when life begins as a scientific proposition. This is not controversial. These are not Christian textbooks. These are just textbooks. Okay? And you can, you can go on. Although life is a continuous process, fertilization is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, a new genetically distinct human organism is thereby formed. Right? Almost all higher animals start their lives from a single cell. 
Okay, the point of fertilization is a starting point in the life history. Okay. Uh, right, there's more. I mean, you look, look at all these textbooks and it'll be similar things. I really don't think the dispute is over when life begins. Okay, maybe, maybe life begins at conception, but at that point it's just a potential person. Maybe that's the dispute. You're a potential person. You're not an actual person, a potential person. Well, there we've got to differentiate between what is referred to as passive potential and active potential. If you have passive potential, that means you need external agents to act on it to make it so, right? An oak tree is not a table. We wouldn't say that. But an oak tree in its passive potential is a table. But we normally don't equate it. You don't look at a tree and say, hey, that's a table. You say, maybe someday that would become a table if somebody cuts it down and turns it into a table. Active potential means the potential is inherent to the nature of the object. So an acorn, in some ways, is a, is a tree, right? That tree is inherent in the natural qualities of the object of the acorn. Right? Passive potential versus active potential. When you're talking about an unborn human being, you're talking about active potential to be a person as anybody would recognize the person. Right? If we're going to say, well, if they're not all the way there yet, and potential doesn't count at all, and Peter Singer is very good at principle on uh, a lot of this, if potential doesn't count, then a person who's drunk, sleeping, insane, temporarily comatose, they could be in trouble if they're not exhibiting the characteristics that we associate with a uh, right to life, right? That temporary lack of potential. Uh, so I just want you to see, I don't think the argument that it's a potential life really gets us that far in identifying where the crux of the dispute is. What's the key point of dispute in, in my view? And I think it, it's a, it's a tough dispute, and I give you the hint of remembering individual autonomy. That, again, the cultural river, that's the cultural river we're swimming in. And I, and I, sometimes people use individual autonomy pejoratively as though it's a negative thing. No, it's good. We like that. We like to be self-sufficient, make decisions for ourselves. Okay, there is a famous, uh, Judith Thompson, a philosopher, had a famous example that's been hugely influential in abortion debates. And it's the story of the famous violinist where said, okay, you're, uh, you're an adult and you somehow were you know, drugged or put to sleep or however it happened, you wake up and you are hooked up intravenously without your consent to a famous violinist who will die if you are disconnected. Can the law force you to stay connected? What Judith Thompson would say is, if you're pro-life, you have to stay, say yes. The law can force you to stay connected to that famous violinist when you wake up. Because that is the abortion question. If you're the woman who is pregnant, can the law force you to stay connected to this unborn human life, knowing that the life will end if you disconnect from it? Okay, it's the famous violinist sort. So, how do you respond to that? Well, Peter Singer says, well, if the violinist and fetus are people, yeah, you've got to stay connected in both cases. I mean, in some ways, Peter Singer is horrifying. In other ways, he's very refreshing because he's so principled and candid. He said, yeah, if that's what you believe, that these are people, and you've got to stay connected to the violinist, and you've got to stay connected to the unborn uh, the fetus. What did Christians say? Christians have traditionally distinguished uh, natural versus artificial. So uh, abortion is not like disconnecting you with tubes from someone you've been connected to artificially through uh, intravenous means. Abortion is more like disconnecting conjoined twins than tubes hooking you to a stranger. Conjoined twins, there's all these ethical issues of under what conditions it would be ethical to, to disconnect those. So they're saying it's a natural versus artificial. 
this is a very sensitive point, and it has to be handled with a lot of sensitivity. Uh, is the woman's participation in the act leading to the pregnancy relevant to the ethics of law forcing her to stay connected to the unborn life within her? If you say yes, if, as I think many people would, you then have to figure out what your answer is on rape and incest, which is a very small percentage of abortions in America, but they're not non-existent. Last I saw it was, it was five to 10,000 uh, a year in that category based on estimates. So what do you do there where it's not, uh, it's not a consensual act to participate that leads to that situation? So I think this is getting us close to the point of dispute. Okay? If you, Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of Planned Parenthood, and, and for understandable reasons, she had some really abhorrent views on eugenics and things like that. But if you go back and read her writings, she, she uh, sort of acted as a, as a midwife to poor immigrant women in New York City. And she wrote stories of her experience doing that. And they're heartbreaking. They're heartbreaking. The women who would die in childbirth, the babies who would die soon after birth, the, you know, the not having any access to contraceptives and the number of babies who would come to families who struggle to support them. They are heartbreaking stories. And I think uh, Christians, and again I'm using broadly Christians as traditionally being pro-life, I think Christians would do well to acknowledge them as heartbreaking stories. That these are difficult. These are difficult. And so what we've seen since in that line of cases, it's an increasing attention to an individual's autonomy to direct their own lives. For women, it's increasing attention to a woman's ability to participate in the economy by having more of a say over her own procreation child. Okay? So what does this mean for how we engage on abortion politics is, in my view, uh, and, and I'll get to this a little bit more at the end or either beginning on tomorrow, is engaging on abortion can never be just about abortion. It has to be part of a broader understanding of how we support the bringing of new life into our society. And there's been a, a tragic lack of support, especially for poor women who feel like they have no choice. And so, you know, I think every church that is going to be outspoken on these issues also has to be acting in the community to support these things and acknowledge the tragedy. And since just looking at John Powsley, who's leading a ministry in that area, and others who've been very active in those ministries. But it's for me uh, when you when you talk about abortion, when life begins, that's a distraction. I mean, I don't I don't think seriously that can be the focus of the dispute. I think it's about how do we support women who for good reasons have felt completely disempowered in this area, not just recently, but stretching back hundreds of years. And how can we uh, support them where the community has a stake and has a stewardship over decisions that support life? And when uh, we can talk about this more, but when you're in, when you're engaging on abortion, if you if, if we can empathize with the desperation that a person may feel in making that decision, that can shape the decisions we make ten steps back in terms of how we're investing our time and resources in supporting this. When it's all about, at the legal angle of, when does life begin? When does the Supreme Court say life begins? We're missing, we're missing the, the crux of the opportunity for relationship and the opportunity to bring 
uh, people in very difficult circumstances into a broader relationship with the community and with the knowledge of God's love that comes through the existence. Okay? So this is where I think the crux is. It's the, and again, we're all swimming in this cultural river. And the a pro-life view is very strongly countercultural, not because people don't value babies primarily, but because people value individual autonomy and want to rectify what had been the marginalization and in some cases oppression of women, especially poor. Women. Okay. Questions? Let me talk a little bit before we end about euthanasia. So euthanasia, assisted suicide, right? That's another thing that has been around for a while and is growing um, in some areas of the world. And how do we engage on it? And then, uh, well, Christian ethics, uh, I'm not an ethicist, so I can't go into huge detail on this, but just the, the basics of it. Christian ethics focuses on the intent, right? Are you intending? to end the life, or are you intending to alleviate suffering, even if it might bring a hastening of the end of life? That's a key difference, right? You cannot intend to kill an innocent person even at their own request, period, right line. But you can intend to help control the severe pain through medication, even if hastening of death is foreseeable. Okay? That's how Christians traditionally have understood euthanasia, end of life issues. Peter Singer. Supports euthanasia. I just found this interesting. Though. When his mother developed advanced Alzheimer's, he spent a lot of money on her care, even though she no longer qualified as a person under his criteria. And he said that applying his view might be, quote, more difficult than he felt. <laughs> but again, I, I love Peter Singer because he's honest. He doesn't try to cover it over. He's like, oh, no, this is tougher than they thought. This is my mom. Uh, OK, so euthanasia. Can the practice be limited? We're always concerned with the slippery slope when we talk about euthanasia, and we've seen a slippery slope in other areas. So two examples of where it hasn't been limited, where it has, you know, roughly been limited. In the Netherlands, where they've had euthanasia for quite a while, uh, the request for assisted dying must be voluntary, lasting, and well-considered, and the doctor must be convinced that the patient is experiencing unbearable suffering without prospect of improvement. Okay? So it extends beyond terminal diseases to mental illnesses and dementia. Last year, 4%, I actually think 4.5% of all deaths in the Netherlands were by euthanasia. That's a 4.5% of all deaths were by euthanasia. Then last October, the government ministers in the Netherlands proposed extending euthanasia to the elderly who believe their life is complete. Okay, so it's in the Netherlands, it's hard to avoid that slippery slope. It's a terminal disease and with, with extreme suffering where you say, oh, well, I can kind of understand that, to where well, you just feel hopeless and to where, oh, I'm not hopeless or suffering, but I think, I think I'm done. Okay. On the other hand, Oregon, uh, which has had uh, assisted suicide law since 1997, it's been much more restrained. I'm not, Defending it or saying it's effective, I'm just saying it's been much more restrained than the Netherlands experience. So in 2016, a total of 133 people died from medications prescribed for purposes of euthanasia. There's been over 1,100 since 1997. In Oregon, it must be a terminal disease that's accompanied by suffering, and the vast majority of those are terminal cancers, and the vast majority are not. I offer that just, we. The Netherlands has almost become a caricature of itself and mm -hmm. how it's done this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's easy to say, well, it's all the Netherlands. If you go this much, it's going to be. Well, in reality, Oregon has kept it restrained. Doesn't mean it's right, but if we're arguing about this, we need to be fair. That Oregon hasn't shown that same slippery slope that the, that the Netherlands has. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, all right, Chuck, how many followed the case of Charlie Gard at all, heard of the case of Charlie Gard, okay. And I, I'm, again, I'm not a bioethicist, I'm not an expert on this, I, I'm not a doctor, I don't play one on TV, I just know a little bit about this, and I'm using the Charlie Gard case to frame questions for Christians as we engage on this. Okay, a one-year-old, uh, he didn't, 
tragically didn't live to his first birthday, but just under one year old, he appeared healthy, this is in England, Charlie Carr, he appeared healthy at birth, and then he developed severe brain damage, could not open his eyes or move his limbs, he needed a ventilator, uh, he passed away in July when treatments were deemed uh, completely hopeless even by his parents. His parents, starting in January, had, had been requesting this experimental treatment uh, that could have taken place in the United States called nucleoside therapy. They raised enough funds, well over a million dollars, that could have uh, taken into the U.S. for the treatment, not for a cure, but for a treatment. Charlie's doctors in England said it wouldn't work because they, it couldn't reverse the brain damage. They said he should be taken off life support and the hospital didn't permit him to be transferred elsewhere. And the hospital's reasoning was taking him out of the hospital would have uh, exacerbated his suffering. And so they were doing, in their mind, everything for the best interest of Charlie, of saying he shouldn't be moved, he should be taken off life support, the situation is hopeless, and prolonging it is simply exacerbating Charlie's suffering. The court, this obviously got lawyers involved, and the courts, multiple courts ruled that it would be best for Charlie to die with dignity. The parents eventually gave up the legal fight after too much time had passed. So this is just last month, and the parents said, based on their own experts, even their experts said, well now it really is hopeless, because so much time has passed, the treatment would be pointless, and the parents said, we give up. So, this got a lot of attention. This had uh, the president tweeting. It had the, it had the Pope speaking about it. It had a lots of uh, concerned uh, religious figures in Ephesus weighing in. And it really brought, um, it brought to the fore. What does the sanctity of life, what does our belief in the sanctity of life mean for children? A baby whose parents wanted to try everything, to try to give him quality of life and to prolong his life, and what was perceived as sort of the cold, hard reality of the doctor saying, it's not going to work, what's best for Charlie is to let him die now in the hospital. Okay? So what does it mean? And I don't have answers to these. I'm raising them for you as you think about how to engage even a Charlie Garb case with better understanding. Is there a moral requirement to pursue extraordinary care? Like, do we think that the hospital or the parents or somebody was required to pursue extraordinary care for Charlie? And is it different from a gravely ill cancer patient declining another round of chemotherapy, which I think most Christians would say, that's okay, or that's, that's different. Why is it different? Because it's a, it's a baby who's not able to make that choice for themselves, and so we have to assume that there's a choice for life. Is there a moral requirement not to pursue extraordinary care? Right? Is it somehow immoral for the parents wanting to be spending $2 million that could go to other folks on a 0.5% you know, chance that you're going to be able to, to help Charlie? Right? What, if the, what if they didn't raise private funds and they were asking the hospital to fund this? Right? What if the hospital had to cut care for other parents? How, is that relevant? We're a little uncomfortable with that being relevant, but in the real world, if you're the hospital trying to figure out the budget and how to pay for it, what, how do we make that work? What's the focus of the Christian response in this case? Is the focus the parental authority to make the decision for their son. Does that extend to any decision the parents would make? Right? So, as, as Christians, for the most part, we're very concerned with the Charlie Gard case and how it played out. Is it really about the parent authority? And so if the parents had said, we want Charlie taken off life support, that would be fine? Maybe, maybe. So it could be about parental authority. Is the focus on pursuing any chance to keep him alive? Like, what does the sanctity life mean? Does it mean that we got to, if there's 0.1 chance of, of life extending one week, even if there's pain accompanying that life, we choose life always. Is that what it means? 
Does it mean we pursue any chance to restore a meaningful quality of life? Oh, okay, well, what's a meaningful quality of life? We get a little nervous with that because that gets into the euthanasia debate centrally. But what's a meaningful quality of life? Is our focus on prioritizing healthcare resources in light of community needs? That gets us really nervous. But it's hard to avoid. I mean, somebody has to set these priorities. There's not a limitless pot of money to pursue extraordinary care for every, uh, every ill patient or ill baby. This one rose to the top of the media uh, because you know, for reasons that I think the hospital didn't handle it. So well, but there are similar things that happen all the time. And then back to individual autonomy. Whatever happened to individual autonomy? What about the parents' autonomy speaking on behalf of Charlie? How did that happen? I thought our whole direction in law was empower the individual person to make these decisions. And then you've got parents saying, yeah, we're ready to make this decision. What happened? There's now a hospital board saying that we can't, we can't do it. I mean, one question to ask is, does prioritizing autonomy over life eventually make life vulnerable to other values? Right? Once you, that's why the, that's why the traditional Christian uh, community, I think, one reason they've been so strong and stalwart on life is once you start giving ground. You might give ground to very noble reasons, but then do you lose your ability to stand up to reasons that are a little bit less noble? Right? So there's a lot going on in the Charlie Guard thing. I don't, again, I don't have the answers. I'm just framing them uh, for you to think more about. Let me, uh, let me end with this. How do you build relationships across the divide on sanctity of life? Do we stand for life only by, or sorry, only through our votes, or are we committing our time and money to supporting the vulnerable in our communities? Right? That's why one criticism of Christians being so strong on sanctity of life issues uh, that we have to take seriously this criticism is that you're not walking the walk, and that makes us think. <laughs> that your opposition to what we want to do is not because you care for the vulnerable, it's because you don't care about us. And it's about power. Right? So how do you walk the walk on this? Right? Of coming alongside folks who are feeling at the margins and affirming. Uh, are there areas of shared concern? Like for example, can there be more government support for prenatal care for the poor? Community centers for the elderly? Do we live as though these lives matter? Yes. Right? One of the things that I think is so toxic about our political culture now is it's all or nothing, us versus them, and that completely gives up any hope for common points of collaboration. Where you might not have completely overlapping interests, but maybe you have a connecting interest. Are there things that we could do if we could work even with those who oppose us on, on the bigger picture? Difficult question. If Roe versus Wade is overturned, what should the law's treatment of abortion be? And can we <laughs> acknowledge that this is tricky? Right? Do Christians want, uh, do we want to set up sting operations with false back alley abortion clinics so we can arrest pregnant moms who are coming in thinking they can get an abortion? Is that what we want to do and throw them in jail? Is it really more just a licensing, licensing regime where we deny licenses to abortion providers if Roe versus Wade is over? I mean, what, in one way, it's been easy to have Roe versus Wade in place for Christians because we haven't had to articulate what should be the law. We can't ignore that question, and it's, it's hard. Can we recognize that insisting on life creates tension with pursuit of the good as it's been defined in our culture for many years. It should be no surprise that it meets resistance. So 
The law, as I've said before, the law is a product of culture. If Christians are opposing particular threads within our law, we are also opposing our culture, which means we need to be fully engaged and prepared for that, but it also means we should have a degree of empathy for those who oppose us, because they've also been formed by their culture, right? They're, they're swimming with the stream, right? They're going along with the current. It's, and so when they hear, if they hear Christians sort of yelling at them about, you know, the evil personified, that's not so helpful. They're just, they're just living as they've been understanding how you live, right? And so how do we stand up for these core Christian commitments without losing sight of the humanity of those who oppose us? Okay, we've run out uh, of our time. Yes, announcement? Announcement would be, congratulations, this church has been here since 1894, and this is the largest attendance and gathering in this very room ever. Since 1894, 165 strong, you guys. Also, somebody can just pose questions to you. Ah, uh, yeah. So here's the announcement. First of all, for those of you, uh, this is for the young adults, 19 to 30, we're going to make an announcement about this class. That's the most important one. For those of you 19 to 20, your barbecue... Um, campfire is over at Lutheran Lakeside Camp, and I have an address for you if you need that to be able to Google it. So if you want to know more information on your campfire time. This class is going to be in the tabernacle tomorrow. Yes. Okay? So obviously we have room where we have 1,200 seats over there. Um, here's the thing I would ask on behalf of Rob and Phil. So that this can be continue to be a community and not just another talking time with people sitting everywhere. Would you please confine yourself to the middle section in front of the soundboard so that you can have some community aspect to it. Um, so you will be in the tabernacle uh, okay. tomorrow. Um, what else would you? Want I'm, I'm going to give you a little plug for tomorrow, encouraging you to come back. Uh, Christians, in my experience, Christians tend to like talking about sanctity of life issues. It's a little less comfortable talking about race. Okay? The, our Minneapolis Star Tribune paper did a survey last year about Black Lives Matter. Minnesotans, 6% of white Minnesotans had a favorable view of Black Lives Matter. 94% of black Minnesotans had a favorable view of Black Lives Matter. That's a problem. So today I was talking about a traditional Christian view with this versus non-Christian view. Tomorrow, that's not what I'm doing. Tomorrow, I'm talking about a traditional white Christian view versus a traditional black Christian view. And we're going to start with where we are now and work backwards to see how our legal and political cultures have contributed to where we are now. So it might not be a completely comfortable conversation, but I really encourage you to come and participate. So, uh, should we, I'll say one.